Hello, and welcome to another episode of the R Foundations podcast. My name is Joshua. I am your host. And today's episode will be on our current situation as a society. So the previous series that we just got out of was all about corruption and conspiracy, how those things tie together, what the facts are based on actual quotes and excerpts from people that actually have influence and that are a part of these things, and then expanding that out to a more macro view and even tying that into things that are happening in today's age. So we're coming out of that and now looking at where this has led us. That's where we are today. So I'm going to try to go over that, looking at everything from the economic situation to the education system to our current culture and what that has really brought us into and how all those things tie together. So as a reminder, season four that we're in right now is uh, using some older episodes as a framework to look at everything, the evolution of society from a macro perspective. So I did do a whole series on all these things. I did a whole episode called Debt-Based Society, one related to, I think, schooling over education. And the next one was about PC culture. And that was before the Church of Woke was a term. That was before woke was a popular term, at least. And I was basically calling out a lot of the things that really took root within the next year or two with George Floyd, BLM, all that kind of stuff. So uh, transgenderism, yeah, it goes on and on. So uh, if you want more on these things, go back to season one and you can get some different information and more concentrated information, more specific information on these things. What I am trying to do in season four is take the overview of basically the evolution of society, take it in large chunks and look at how all these things tie together, how the dots connect, and try to piece it together in that way from that broader perspective. So that's what I'm doing today, and I will go ahead and just get right in it. So the number one, uh, I guess, way that I would describe our society today as far as economics are concerned, and this goes from individuals to corporations to governments, it's all, it's all debt-based. That's the main thing. It's all based on debt. And this has some obvious issues, but it also has some advantages. So if you are using debt, then you can gain access to funds and value and assets that you would not have access to otherwise. So it does provide some benefits. And if you are paying for that debt in the form of likely interest rates, then there is a whole nother economy that's going on to support all of this debt. And there is more economic activity going on uh, through what you are doing with the money that you get in the form of debt. And then you use that to buy things or to invest or to do things with it. So there are some benefits here. As an individual, I can take advantage of something like inflation. So if I have 0% interest rates or something similar to that, extremely low interest rates, then what I can do is say borrow $10,000 today and I can spend that $10,000 while it is still worth whatever the heck $10,000 is worth today. But 10 years down the road, when I finally pay off that loan, I'll still be making payments and the payments will be the same as the very first payment that I make when I get that $10,000 loan. But that dollar amount, let's say it's $800, that $800 today will buy me a lot more than $800 will buy me 10 years from now. You can look at something like the price of gas, the price of a gallon of milk, uh, all these kinds of factors for inflation, gold, everything like that. And you can get a clear picture that over time, the value of fiat money diminishes through inflation. And so if I can get a hold of a large chunk of money now, while it is worth more than it will be in the future, spend it now to buy everything that I can, get the full value out of it now, and then as I'm paying it off, the value of the payments I'm making 
is actually less and less over time. So even though I'm paying the same dollar amount, those dollars are worth less. And so I am, in a sense, sacrificing less as I move on and on. So for example, if a payment is currently a month's worth of groceries, and let's say that that's $800, and let's say that the size of a family that we're using, as an example here, spends $800 a month on groceries. Well, that's now. And now that will buy eight, $800 will buy a month's worth of groceries. However, 10 years from now, that same $800, it's, same, it's the same dollar amount, but $800 might only buy two weeks worth of groceries. So when I first start paying that loan, that first payment is the equivalent of a month's worth of groceries. I'm basically giving up the value of a month's worth of groceries. But by the time I get to the end, I'm only giving up the value of maybe two weeks worth of groceries at most. And so that's a definitely a lot easier for me to swing. It's easier for me to uh, pay the value of a few weeks worth of groceries than four weeks worth of groceries. That's just common sense there in math. So uh, that is a way that an individual can take advantage. Another way is that if someone has an investment that they can make that will get a return on it that is higher than the interest that I will pay on it, then you can benefit in that way too. So say I borrow the $10,000 and I'm paying 2% interest annualized, then if I am able to invest that in a place where I am fairly certain I can get, say, 4%, a 4% per year return on my investment, then it could make sense financially to go ahead and borrow the $10,000 now, put it into this investment, earn 10% a year, I am paying 2% a year. And so in a sense, I am netting 2% profit every single year. And this is all using somebody else's money. It's not even money that I had to begin with. So I am basically, in a sense, getting 2% on free money. So that's not such a bad deal. So you can see why using debt can be very beneficial. You expand that out to a corporation or to a government even, and this just exponentially grows as far as the value that someone can get out of using this type of system, a debt-based system. And with fiat money, it is much easier to do. And it is usually much more beneficial to do because if you have inflation eating away at your value, then it makes more sense to use debt because if you just keep cash and you save cash and you save money, then the value of that money goes down over time and that's not what you want. Whereas if you put that money into something, then that would be a much better way of handling your value, your assets. Also with a fiat money system, the government can control the monetary policy and uh, artificially change the parameters of the market. It is not a free and open market, and there are advantages to that from, let's say, a governmental perspective. Now, well, with all this and related to this is the fact that our current economy, our current monetary system has been artificially boosted. This has been done through printing money, through inflation, through low interest rates, artificially low interest rates, near zero interest rates, sometimes in some countries even negative in the previous, let's say, decade or less. And the fact that the dollar has the reserve currency status, worldwide reserve currency is the dollar. So uh, with all of these things, these have artificially boosted the dollar. And I'm going to use the dollar because I typically use the US as the example. And so with the dollar, the dollar is artificially boosted. The US economy is artificially boosted. All the corporations, the individuals, the government, all of these things have been artificially boosted up. And so if you imagine the bubble analogy, that bubble has been blown up and now it is a fairly large bubble. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean the bubble is going to pop any second, although it could. It could double in size before it pops. Who knows? But uh, that is the situation we are currently in. And so right now, at least as I'm recording this, we are starting to see the effects of this, where inflation is starting to rise at rates that we haven't seen in many decades. We've got interest rates that are just now starting to rise. As I'm recording this, the Fed has raised the interest rate at their last meeting, and that is the first time they have done that in quite a while, although they have threatened it many times. 
And so they see that there is inflation. The way to combat inflation is to raise interest rates. And that will help because when interest rates are higher, people will borrow less money, which means they're spending less money, which means that there is less dollars going after goods. And through supply and demand, that means the price of those goods will be a lot more stable than if there are there is a large influx of dollars going after the same goods, and that drives the price up. And that would be directly related to inflation. That's what inflation is, where the price of goods is going up, 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 which means the value of the dollar that you're buying those goods with goes down, 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 down. And that is currently what we're experiencing, and they're trying to raise interest rates. Now, when I recorded the episode a few years ago in season one that talked about, or at least touched on some of this stuff, I had mentioned that that this is the situation that we were in even then, and that uh, basically the Fed's kind of screwed because if they do raise interest rates, historically, there's a downturn in the market. And they had already threatened it, and they had even tried little bits at a time, I think about two years ago, if I remember right, and the market started to sell off. And so they stopped. And they uh, continued on with their monetary easing. But now they are finally in this situation where it looks like they are not in control. They've been able to finesse the situation. Even the 2008 financial crisis is a good example of this, where they didn't actually fix any of the problems, but they were able to finesse it in such a way that we can blow the bubble up even further before it pops. And again, if you want more on that specifically, I did talk about that a lot in season one and whatever episode it was, Debt-Based Society. And so uh, with this, we are seeing this issue where inflation is potentially going to be out of control unless they do something about it. Well, they are doing something about it. They're going to raise interest rates. What happens when you raise interest rates? Well, there's a giant market sell-off. And what happens when you have a big sell-off in the markets? Typically, recession, depression, depression the 2008 financial crisis, for example. And so that's kind of where we are right now. We were already in that situation, but the past few years has really just increased the issues that already existed, whether it be inflation, whether it be money printing, whether it be the debt of the government or debt of corporations, whether it be any number of these things, the overall GDP, the overall worldwide economy since COVID uh, really tanked in that time period. And so basically, all of these things are not looking so good. And historically, at least, this means that we are going to see a downturn, a crash, a recession, a depression, something like that in the near future. Now, I think a few years ago, I had said that's probably in the next five years or less. I would say now, probably more like the next two years or so at most. We will see, though. And uh, yeah, there's really just not much that can be done about it that I know of, at least. So another way to understand this would be to uh, look from a Keynesian perspective as well as from an Austrian perspective, because they can both uh, add some value to this assessment here. So from a Keynesian perspective, there is less demand in the marketplace when you raise interest rates. And that's what I was explaining earlier through supply and demand. People have less money, so they're buying less goods. So there is less demand for goods. So uh, that is one issue. So as you start to approach an economic downturn, interest rates are starting to rise. You have inflation starting to pick up. And through these two things, as well as typically other things in the economy, you end up with this issue of there being less demand and so less economic activity. And from a Keynesian perspective, that would mean that you are in this downturn and then you'll have to artificially stimulate things once you get into this downturn to kind of stabilize the economy. Now, from a Keynesian perspective, they're also kind of screwed because they've already been artificially stimulating the markets and artificially boosting everything in the economy for years now. And so they don't really have a whole lot to work with. It's not like they can really lower interest rates very much. And with the inflation issue, that's not really something you really want to do. That's not going to go very well because then inflation will, at a minimum, continue more than likely start to skyrocket even further. So they're kind of stuck right now. Now, from an Austrian perspective, you can get a little more out of this, a little different viewpoint here. And what they would say would be that the artificially low interest rates have uh, increased demand 
And uh, what they have stimulated is malinvestment. And so companies, individuals, governments, they have this cheap money or this free money, and they're taking advantage. They're getting as much as they can. They're dumping it into anything and everything they can. And again, if they are getting a higher return than the interest they are paying, then it is worth it from a financial perspective for a corporation, even for an individual. And so people are doing this because it makes sense. The problem is that the only reason interest rates are so low are because it is being artificially lowered. And so as they start to rise, then what used to be a profitable venture might not be so anymore. So now if interest rates are, let's say, essentially 4% on some type of loan that you're going after as a corporation, and it was 2%, then all of a sudden the project that nets a roughly 4% annual return on the investment is going to net you $0 profit. And that is if it returns the 4% that is expected. If it does not do as well as expected, then you'll actually be losing money as a corporation. So will you make that investment? Well, probably not, unless there are other extenuating circumstances that stimulates you to do that. That's probably not going to go well. And so the problem is that all of these things have been bought. All these projects have been started. All these ventures have started to get going with this really cheap money. And there are things that probably shouldn't have been invested in, things that shouldn't have been bought, things that shouldn't have been started, because they're very low profits. The value is relatively low uh, compared to the demand in the marketplace, or else those profits would have been higher. And so it's just all this money that's rushing in to do something. They just want to do something with this money, and it doesn't take much. Well, that that's not a good way to handle your finances in general. That is not a strong economy. That's just dumping money into anything that might possibly squeak you out a little bit of extra. And so the problem is, as interest rates rise, then there is a much higher threshold. You have to get much higher returns. And the majority of the things invested right now are not very high yielding. And so that's going to start to bite people in the butt, and especially bite corporations as this continues. And so all of these have been, all these issues have been exponentially increased through the past practices of monetary policy and economic manipulation. And this is just where we are. So from a Keynesian view, from an Austrian view, we are headed towards a depression, a recession, a financial issue, a financial crisis, an economic downturn, however you want to describe this. And even from the typical uh, viewpoint of where we are with inflation, interest rates, these kinds of things, even outside of a Keynesian or Austrian perspective, just historically, that this is the point where we get that downturn. And uh, the other component to this, and the last thing I'll touch on from an economic perspective, would be the reserve currency status of the dollar. So even though we've had a lot of these issues for quite a while, the advantage for the U.S. government is that the U.S. dollar is used worldwide. And as a reminder, that's from Bretton Woods, where basically after World War II, the economies of the majority of the world were totally screwed, and they didn't have the ability to back their currencies by the gold or hard assets anymore. So the US, who was largely untouched from the war, said, hey, we're backed by gold. Why don't you just use our currency as your reserve? And then in a sense, yours will be backed by gold, but you won't have to actually have all this gold. And uh, basically, everybody agreed with this. The dollar was the reserve currency. And then we came off the gold backing. And so that was a bit of an issue. But what we did do is we paired up with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia says, hey, if you will be our military and you will guarantee us oil contracts and these types of things, you can sell us arms and train us and be our allies in the Middle East, then what we will do is only sell oil in dollars. And that's a really big deal because oil is, or was at least the most valuable resource at the time. And so in doing so, people needed dollars to buy this essential resource, that resource of oil. And so you had the petrodollar. And uh, that was holding pretty strong until very recently, like just the past few years. And so although we didn't have the gold uh, backing anymore, um, we had the petro backing. But now that petro backing is starting to fail. The only thing that's left is just the American empire and the American military. That That's about all we got now. So 
if the petrodollar aspect drops down, then all we're left with is the military and uh, status quo, maybe. Uh, we That's not something that I would rely on for a global reserve currency at all. So the issue has been that Russia, China, India, lots of different countries, pretty large-scale economies, have been buying and selling oil in other currencies. And so the U.S. dollar is no longer required to buy oil. Now, most oil is still denominated in dollars, so we still, we're still we still hanging in there. However, just a few days ago, at least as of this recording, Saudi Arabia said that they are going to start doing oil contracts in the Chinese yuan. And that also does not bode very well at all for the dollar, because if our allies in Saudi Arabia start to back out of that petrodollar deal, then we officially do not have a petrodollar, which means that, again, we are just waiting and holding on to this aspect of the U.S. military backing up as the last backstop. And if uh, we have less demand for dollars in general, so let's say we keep this reserve currency status to some degree, and we might to some degree, but there is going to be less demand for dollars because people don't need them to back up their currencies because it's kind of pointless because it's not backed by gold anyway. People don't need them to buy oil anymore if they have a good connection locally. And so, although people will still hold them, not nearly as much as would have otherwise. So with less demand, we are no longer able to export as many dollars. And that was a huge benefit to us because the government could print off as much as they wanted, uh, relatively almost as much as they wanted, and they could just send that overseas. There is so much demand worldwide for dollars that when dollars get printed, they can get shipped off to another country and another country can use them as their reserves or exchange currencies for dollars, however they want to do that. And there was a lot of demand for dollars worldwide, which in a sense made us able to export our inflation. So instead of having all these extra dollars stay within the United States and start to cause inflation in our own economy and having this large influx of dollars in this, it's a large economy, but a relatively small when compared to a global scale. And that would cause uh, inflation that would just automatically cause it. We already have inflation, but it would definitely make it much, much, much worse. However, if we can print these dollars and there's this high demand where a lot of these dollars are going out and going overseas, then a lot of that inflation is spread out among all the different countries that have this demand and that hold dollars and want new dollars. And so we are able to export our inflation around the world. Now, other countries are not very fond of that, nor have they been fond of having to use dollars for oil, nor are they fond of us coming off the gold standard, nor are they fond of our interventionist policies, nor are they a big fan of our military interventions, the coups that we lead in South America, Middle East, everywhere else. So yes, America is not very well liked around the world for many reasons. But all of this is putting us in this position where Uh, Our economy's uh, not looking so hot. The economy itself is down as far as just overall numbers and statistics. The stock market has started to sell off as well. Interest rates are rising, which historically means markets are coming down as well. There's less demand out there, which means the same thing. The Keynesians say we're headed for the same thing. The Austrians say we're headed for the downturn. Yeah, that's kind of just where we are. It's just going to make it that much worse if we also lose the global reserve reserve currency status of the dollar. That is a really big deal. And arguably, that's one of the biggest reasons why if we do get involved with a more world war, World War Three, then that might be one of the deciding factors there. And it's just a matter of will the US give up the global reserve currency status? Will they give up that American empire and our military conquest and interventions around the world? And I don't know if they will, at least not without trying to uh, manipulate their way back into things. So we will see how that goes. But that's kind of just where we are. So uh, no, not puppies and unicorns and rainbows, but it is just good to be aware of our current economic situation. Now, 
All of this is because of the things that I've covered in previous episodes. So uh, as I started season four, I talked about kind of the origins of money and early economics, then the modern history of our current systems and uh, some issues involved there, getting into the conspiracies and the corruption that were involved, especially the central banking situation, as well as the Federal Reserve and all of these kinds of things, false flags, all these things are related and they have led us to where we are today. And this is where we are today. Now, shifting a little bit into the education system and uh, what the past has brought us into, and this will tie directly into our culture and looking from a more uh, governmental societal standpoint. So uh, with our schooling situation, I've talked about all the, all the negatives and kind of how we got where we were, the Prussian education model, these kinds of things. But what has that led us to? Where are we today because of these things? And you can even insert here the robber barons getting involved in the education system and all of this type of stuff. Well, the main issue to me, at least, would be looking at the Trivium model, which I've mentioned before. And just to briefly remind you, if you don't remember, the Trivium is a model that's based on three parts. Those are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And so grammar is the fundamental building blocks of a thing. And this could be anything. A language would be the easiest way to describe it very briefly, like I'm attempting to do right now. So the grammar would be the words, the letters, the sounds, all these kinds of things. Then the logic layer would be the next step. And it's how do those things come together? What do they mean? How? What is a sentence and what is it trying to tell? Tell us, how can we make sense of all of this grammar that's jumbled together? That would be the logic. It's understanding these things. And then the rhetoric is how do we use this grammar and logic to achieve a certain goal? And so rhetoric could be like a speech. You're using grammar and logic in order to get across a point, to change the mood of a crowd, to get people to do something or commit some action or to change the way they think, whatever the case may be. This is the rhetoric level. And so going back to the education system as it exists today, after all of the issues that have gone on over the past many decades, then we are in this place where a lot of society, and I would say ever since kind of the early 1900s when this really kicked into gear with the robber barons and their influence and all of that kind of thing, that we have been gradually getting into this issue of being stuck at the grammar level. And if anything, we have logic, but that logic is fairly segregated. And so when you're at the grammar level and even the logic level, and that's a segregated logic level, then you're stuck with monolayer thinking, where you can only look at things from this single layer perspective. You see the top layer and you can see uh, what that means and you can tie some things together with it, but you don't see the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth layer and all of the different connections on a wider perspective. And so when you have knowledge and understanding isolated and specialized, then uh, what people tend to do is leave the thinking and the action to somebody else, to someone outside of your field, to an expert in their own field. So if it's in your field, you do have this logic, this understanding, but it is isolated and specialized to only the thing that you do and only the thing that you know. And you might have a few things that you do and a few things that you know, but that's about it. And so if there is something that is outside of that field, then typically these uh, efforts, the thinking, the action, the planning, all of these things get outsourced to the experts. And I would put experts in quotes here because they're not always truly the experts, but what are perceived as being the experts at least. And in doing all of this, you have this increase in laziness. Uh, Number one, because of these issues, because you're subbing out a lot of your thinking and critical thinking especially, But number two, just the way the education system has been for the past many decades, the past few generations, not just the current one, not just the past one, but multiple. And so once you have multiple generations with a certain issue that is uh, a certain structure to the education system, then that means that the parents of the kids 
have also been indoctrinated roughly into the same system as the kids are. So it's not just an issue with the kids today. It's their parents and to a smaller degree, even their parents. And it gets to a smaller and smaller degree the further you go back. But at this point, it's been multiple generations. So we're kind of stuck here. And if you look at this one example of having test-based learning, then uh, that is something that's been going on for quite a while. And when you have a test-based learning model, then all the students do is learn what's on the test. That's kind of the whole point. And you get this competition aspect that's going on. So everyone's always comparing. They're always competing. They're trying to get this highest score. Everything's gamified in, in this way. And so when you do that, Number one, it just totally increases this isolated and specialized thinking and learning because you're, you're specializing and you're isolating only to this certain small subset of material, not the entire bit, not understanding all of it. You just need to make a good grade on the test. You want to make the best grade on the test. So you're putting forth all your effort into knowing these specific things in this specific way and solving your problems the exact way the teacher tells you because that's how you're going to do the best on the test. That's how you're going to earn the highest score. That's how you're going to win. And so uh, with this, there are lots of issues that then come into play. And you end up trying to do either, you either put all of your effort and energy into making this high score, which just draws you even further into this uh, system and this structure that's very segregated, or you do kind of the opposite and you do as little as possible to make whatever is a satisfactory grade to you, and that's different for everyone, on the test. And so if it's just about this test and you can study for 10 minutes right before class and make a B on it, then hey, cool, you're good, you're happy with the B, you're satisfied, you barely had to do any work, awesome, and you move on. The issue is that also you are not really learning much. And so while the person that is diving in with all of their resources and attention, they are learning a lot, but it is very segregated only on the specific content related to the test. The lazier person that's doing the uh, lowest amount needed, the lowest input needed, they are not really learning a lot. And the little bit that they do learn is also highly segregated because they don't really care about the rest of it because they just need to make a certain grade on the test. And so you have this structure that creates students, individuals, adults that end up subbing out their thinking and their efforts to the experts because it's the, it's the teacher, it's the textbook. Uh, they are the ones that will give you the information and it's very specific information that you can only get from them. And if you learn their specific information very well, the way that they want you to learn it, then you're going to score very highly. You're going to win. So yay, good for you. But again, it's just pushing more and more of this expert mentality. And this really pushes... Uh, this issue of trusting authority and uh, trusting the expert, so to say, the quote expert, this would be the teacher, this would be your boss or a manager, this would be the textbook, this would be the economists, this might be the scientist, whoever it is, there are experts in certain things, and you are not an expert in all things. Not only that, you don't even really know a whole lot about the logic that connects all these different things, uh, much less be able to use any rhetoric around it. And so you are in this position where you are falling victim to someone else's rhetoric, and they are the ones that know the logic. And so what you do is, again, you sub out your, uh, your thinking pretty much to these experts. You trust these authorities. That's how you were raised. You trust the authority of your parents when you're a little kid. And then as you get into school, you stop trusting your parents as much. You start trusting the experts of the teachers in the textbook. And most kids would not admit this and would not realize this and would deny it if you said it outright. But in reality, how they learn under the current model, are they really going and learning similar information and comparing information to what the teacher says in the textbook says? No, probably not. They're just taking it at face value and absorbing it and spitting it back out. So that in and of itself is inherently a trust factor that's going on there, a trust relationship. 
And uh, that's what's happening to all of society. So when you get out of the education system, when you get out of school, then again, this just goes to your boss, to the manager. This goes to the experts that are higher above, all the technocrats and the scientists and these types of people. Uh, look at COVID. That was, th- that was the exact thing. It was trust the science, trust the experts. And that was the rhetoric for uh, even further subbing out your critical thinking to someone else. And with all of this, you end up with a society that is very susceptible to being manipulated for basically the majority of these reasons. So through media, individuals or groups or movements can take advantage of these issues to control a narrative, to allocate attention where they want it, to direct anger or blame to one specific place. This is something that can happen and can happen extremely effectively. This rhetoric is extremely effective because of the environment that it is being put into. This environment that is created by the society that is so, uh, yeah, so many different words you could use here, but basically so stuck on monolayer thinking and so lacking in critical thinking and so focused on subbing out their responsibility and their critical thinking and their actions, subbing that out to somebody else. And in doing so, again, uh, they can be fully manipulated and taken advantage of. And this can go uh, even with the direction that individuals are wanting to go themselves. So as an example, it's not necessarily that you're going to convince everyone that the government is good and looking out for your best interest, and we need the government to run our healthcare system and every other system, that you're not going to convince everybody of that. But that's not the point, and you don't need to. Because what you can do is you can use someone's will against them. So it's kind of like if you're in a fight with someone that's stronger than you, you use their strength, you use their momentum against them, and you can take advantage through different moves. Well, it, it's similar in this way. So you have people that are uh, kind of anti-authority, anti-government. They believe that there's a lot of corruption involved and all these kinds of things. So they're not going to buy it. They're not going to buy into a socialist system willingly and knowingly, even though they're already mostly in a socialist system. They just don't fully comprehend that and realize that, but they are not going to jump into this at all. So what you do is you use their momentum, you use their strengths against them, their will that is very strong, and you direct that in a different direction. So you say, oh, you don't trust the government. Oh, you think there's corruption. Oh, you like the idea of the founding fathers and the Constitution. Well, here, look at this, the Q movement or the Trump movement, or often they're tied together, or there are many, many other examples of this. But it's this idea of even taking those that would be I guess, competition in a way, or some sort of threat, or some groups that won't go along with the narrative, you just give them a different narrative. And you use that to your advantage, because then you can pitch the people on this extreme narrative against people on the opposite extreme narrative, and you get them divided, fighting against each other. And again, they stay on this monolayer thinking of what's going on on the surface. Oh, this person's on the right. Oh, this person's on the left. This person is pro-abortion. Oh, this person's anti-abortion. Abortion, and you know they all argue and try to figure things out and vote really hard to try to change the system. But in the end, they don't look up. They don't understand how all of these things are connected. They don't understand the second, the third, the fourth layer, and all of these different things. And that's really the problem. And that's why this rhetoric works so well. It's because we have these issues and because we are being actively manipulated and uh, coming off of this series on corruption and conspiracy, that should be very plain to you now. Actually, in season one, I did uh, this roughly this content I'm covering in today's episode before the corruption and conspiracy series. And as I reviewed that information, it made a lot more sense that we talk about the corruption and conspiracy, which is more related to modern history, which was the series right before that. And it leads directly into these issues. So a lot of this stuff should sound familiar, and it should, uh, hopefully, you are able to connect these dots a lot better when I'm doing this in a more broad macro perspective. At least that's my hope here. And so 
getting into this next age that we are shifting in as a society, we are shifting to a more immaterial culture, a culture that's more based on feelings and emotions and narratives, and not so much on logic and reason, true debate or discussion, these kinds of things. And so with that, you have uh, an increase in all of these issues because, again, it's not about the logic, reason, these types of things. It is more about a narrative, emotions, feelings, which are a lot easier to manipulate. And we, we have this limited access to truth. That has been a major issue. And again, through the media, uh, many, many different forms of media, I'm not just saying the news networks, but the media as a whole, including social media, the news, Hollywood, all these different things. Uh, through all of this, you end up with a lot of very effective rhetoric and manipulation. You have manipulated statistics, manipulated studies. You have very little attention and mental energy allocated to actually learning and actually finding truth, which, which again, like I said, you already have limited access to. It's already not being covered all that much. And when it is, it is truth that is being used as rhetoric to get you to a certain point, to get you thinking in a certain way, to get you doing a certain thing. And so uh, if you really want to get to the broader truths and how these truths connect and what's really going on, you got to allocate some mental energy to this. But when you're so focused on Netflix and Hulu and what's the latest Amazon Prime show and whatever else is going on in the world, you've got all these sports tournaments and all these things, all this entertainment, the bread and the circus. When you are so focused on those things, which are not bad in and of themselves, you can relax with some entertainment at times. But there needs to be balance. You also need to put mental energy towards learning and towards accessing truth. And that's something that you are responsible for. When you outsource that responsibility to others, and it's generally just a broad others, people don't even really think too much on what others they are allocating this to, but they're outsourcing um, this aspect of finding the truth and uh, gaining access to information on what's going on in the world and understanding the world. They're inherently outsourcing that to other people because they're not doing it themselves. So what they... What they learn and what they know is uh, based on what they hear, based on the inputs that they get from people they talk to at work, people they see out and about, their family members, the things they're watching, the shows they're watching, the movies they're watching, what the news says, what the people on the radio say, what the newspaper or the magazines they read say. This is where they're getting all of this input. And again, it's all from outside sources. They are not actively seeking out a lot of this. And so uh, that that's a bit of an issue. Because when you do that, you're stuck with this, uh, this manipulation where you are being manipulated by those that are feeding you all of these inputs. Social media is a great example of this as well. And so uh, this is the problem that we are in today. And this is what has led us to what I would call woke culture, where woke culture has taken root as well as populism and far-right ideologies. And they have really taken root because the ground is so fertile because of all of these things. And the extremes are very attractive to people in modern culture, just like the entertainment that people consume. Again, it's all about the inputs. It's all about the rhetoric, rhetoric the manipulation. So when you're consuming shows and TV and movies where everything is really extreme, it's very action-packed or it's very bloody, or there are, you know, think of a soap opera where it's just extremely dramatic and these crazy things are happening every single episode, everything's extreme. That's what people are entertaining themselves with. That's the input that's coming in. So it would just make sense that out of what comes in comes back out. So they are thinking their perception is oriented towards extremes. That is what the majority of the input is, even on the news. The news is all about entertainment and manipulation. And it's all about, oh, the next biggest story or this little story that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but it's going to pull on your heartstrings and it's going to get you to think in this certain way or whatever the case may be. And so we end up with things like the woke movement versus the far right movement that are both going on and thriving in today's world. 
And then, as I've said about the manipulation of the media that is consumed, uh, that manipulation is directed towards inflaming these things, towards pushing people even further to these extremes, towards manipulating their emotions, which have been admitted to by social media companies like Facebook. And this is something that is intentional. There are reasons for that. You can go back to corruption and conspiracy episodes for uh, that being evident, but I'm not going to get into, nor do I fully know the complete why, the complete who, who then they those are and uh, that's kind of beyond me and uh, that would be nice to know and might be helpful but at least i do know what i do know and i can learn more about it and learn how it affects me and why things are going on and how i can help others as well so that's the goal Now, when we go back to the first thing that I talked about, the economic situation we're in, we're coming up on some sort of economic downturn, some sort of economic instability, or we we might just be in the middle of it right now. We kind of are. And so as this happens, it really inflames the divisiveness. And uh, that is something that is extremely difficult to overcome without true education. Again, if you're not able to have a discussion or debate because people just get so emotional and worked up and they just attack and they use all of these fallacies and various forms of rhetoric in order to uh, distract from the point or just make their point more forcefully or attack someone's character instead of addressing the topic at hand, all of these kinds of things, mostly fallacies, uh, that's what people resort to knowingly or unknowingly knowingly. So again, you can understand why that would be very hard to kind of mend things back together with two divided parties, with two divided ideologies, these types of things. And so as people start to get in more trouble, as they are not doing as well financially, they might be losing their job, their investments are going down, they're they're uncertain. Uncertainty is something that is on the rise and will continue to be on the rise. And that in and of itself is a stressor. Well, look at all the stress, the psychological harm that has happened to the majority of society since COVID started. And even someone who totally believes everything in the mainstream narrative. Um, I guess as the narrative changes, maybe they believe each thing or they have only believed one thing or another within that narrative. It's kind of hard to track there because it does change so much. But let's say someone that's totally bought into everything related to COVID, even they would admit, I would think, that it has been a really hard time for two years. For the majority of society, people are isolated, people are scared, people are dealing with all kinds of abnormal things, and that's an issue for people. And so, again, all of this stuff inflames issues and exponentially increases issues that are already there. And uh, as you as you look from the majority of people's perspective, there are some universals that I think do come out. It's pretty obvious that the government and corporations are corrupt, that greed reigns supreme, whether it be the politicians or the CEOs, that the regular man gets the shaft at all times. It's not about whoever's lowest on the totem pole or midway on the totem pole. It's about who's at the top of the totem pole. And that is it injustices are common. And that's the whole point of the social justice movement. And that's the whole point of the Church of Woke as well. But that's also one of the main points of the Q movement or the Trump movement or anything on the right side as well. It's calling out some of these corruptions, these injustices, and they use that word very differently. But it's the same overall universal idea that that things are wrong, that the system is broken and corrupt. And this creates a population that is ripe for a solution, for a change, for a reset of the current system, because the current one is corrupt and broken. So again, if you go through this idea of problem, reaction, solution, then uh, people are already ripe. They've had the problem. They've had the reaction. Now we're ripe for a solution. And in a way, it is just trends that are playing out. So you could see from a historical patterns perspective that there are these trends that happen and this is just how the trend is playing out. This is where we're headed. As long as we don't have anything crazy drastic that goes differently this time as compared to the rest of human history, you know, this is where we're headed and these are the issues the way that they stand. And so in a way, these are just trends that are playing out on a macro perspective. But We also know that these trends have been steered 
and that conditions have been artificially manipulated deliberately. So again, go back to the corruption and conspiracy episodes I just did, read through those quotes, or listen to the quotes that I read through, and in doing so, it becomes extremely clear that things have been intentionally manipulated and steered. So even though there are trends that do play out, uh, those trends have kind of been hijacked in a way because, you know, people at the top are just as smart as you and I are, if not much more. And so it's not like they are oblivious to all of these things I'm talking about. They are fully aware of them and fully making use of them. Now, at the top, I'm not referring to someone like a Biden. I am referring to someone like a Rothschild. These are two totally different levels levels and layers. So uh, with all this, we can all agree that the system is broken. We, as in you and I listening to you listening to this podcast, me doing this podcast, we're probably fairly like-minded on a lot of things. And the total normie or the total woke activist, all of us can agree that the system is broken. And we all want to build something better. The question just is what and who? If we rely on how we've been groomed, where we outsource these things to the experts, then we end up going right into technocracy. And we are headed right there. And I think we are going there. And that's the next stage, unfortunately. But that's what happens. And again, that's the trend. It just all lines up. When we get to the historical cycles and patterns episodes that hopefully are coming up soon, because I'm really excited about them, I'd love to do those from a macro perspective and really tie them all together. Uh, all of this will start to make even more sense and coalesce even stronger. But uh, with all of this, we are in this situation where you have the Great Reset going on from the World Economic Forum. You have um, a lack of faith in the political and governmental systems worldwide. You had a huge populism movement that was going on over the past few years. You've got the opposite movement on the left with the woke, the Church of Woke, and that's even infected things like the Catholic Church and the Vatican all the way to uh, just common school kids. And so we have this issue where... We see that things are broken. We want them to be better. And the problem is that the majority of society is outsourcing the making the system better to someone else, to the experts. And that's why we are going to get technocracy. That's that's exactly what's going to happen. How it plays out, I don't know. And yes, there is a chance that things, for whatever reason, go drastically different than they have throughout all of human history. But I would find that to be very unlikely, that we will probably fall in line with these trends, we'll fall in line with the intentions of those behind the scenes that are manipulating things, we will fall in line with the natural results of uh, a society in the condition that it's in today, an economy in the condition that it is today, and that's just what's going on. So, that leads me directly to uh, next week's episode that I will do next week. And that one will be all about some of these solutions, all about building something better, all about, well, if the system is broken and if there are problems and if we want to build something better, what the heck are the options? What are some examples of this? What are some ideologies? What are some strategies, some methods? So things like, and I haven't looked in detail at what I'm covering, but uh, probably things like agorism or anarcho-capitalism or even possibly anarcho-communism, or who knows what. I'll get into all kinds of stuff. But basically, what are the alternatives? And I, I might, and I'm not sure if I'll tie all this together in one episode or if it'll be two or more, um, but I might even get into things like homeschooling and homesteading and all of these kinds of things. How do you become more resilient to things that are likely to happen? How do you become less reliant on this system that is broken and is corrupt? And how do you better your situation for yourself, for your family, for your community? How do you do that? And so I want to talk about those things. And that's what is coming up in the next episode or few episodes. So with that, I will wrap up today's episode. If you are interested, feel free to follow on Twitter. That would be at FoundationsPC or check out the website. I've got some information on there as well. You can also stream directly from the website if that's easier than a podcast player for you. There are other ways of getting in touch, such as email. 
that's probably the best way to directly get in touch with me. And that would be our foundations at protonmail.com. And I would love to hear from you, whether it be feedback, questions, comments, whatever, feel free to reach out, please do. And if you're enjoying this content, you want others to be able to enjoy this content as well, please rate and review the podcast so that it can get out there to more people and be uh, more popular, ideally, so that more people will be hearing it and be exposed to these types of things and exposed in a good way. And also, if you strongly believe that this content should be out there, should be free to people, and that you want to support what I am trying to do here, then please feel free to financially support it. Put your money where your mouth is, so to say. And I have a link for the Patreon page and the Subscribestar page in the show notes. And please do join me if that is something that you are personally invested in as well. And I will use those funds directly for this podcast, not just to pay myself. And they will go towards paying the hosting fees and the new equipment that I need at times, the books for research and Audible subscription, all these kinds of things that I need to be able to do what I do. And I greatly appreciate those that have been giving already. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. It is a big help. The final note here would be that if you are interested in a Christian libertarian perspective on what do we do about these things, and you want this idea of Christian agorism or starting even a secular agorist group locally in your area, then you might be interested in a recent interview that I did on the Libertarian Christian Institute podcast. You can find a link for that on the show notes, as well as just go to LCI. I forget the the name of the website, but it's Libertarian Christian Institute. You can find it very easily. They have a podcast. I've been on there a few times, but uh, this most recent one was specifically on Christian agorism and having a local agorist group that we have done here where I am and talking about that and how we've done that and how that has gone, these types of things. So if you're interested, please do check that out. I'll be back next week. Until then, I'm out. Peace. This has been our Foundations Podcast. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. (laughs) (laughs) Bye-bye.